Hello, and welcome to another issue of uh, Public Affairs, Public Access. I'm your guest host, David Hutzelman, and this is a show where we uh, normally discuss uh, public policy and political science issues from a libertarian perspective. And generally, we look at uh, issues that are uh, being debated in the, uh, in the nation today. But uh, today, we have uh, quite a different perspective. Uh, I have a guest returning to the show who's been on several times before. It's uh, Carl Jarvis, who's a constitutional historian and uh, political uh, uh, scholar. And uh, he has just written a new book, which is called The uh, United States of Dysfunction. And the subtitle of that is uh, America's Leadership Crisis and What We Can Do About It. Now, uh, I have read the book, and uh, it doesn't read like most other books you would uh, read about political science. It's not about what issues we should take, what's, how do you build a majority on the issues you want. It's a very different approach, so uh, in some ways it should appeal to uh, Republicans, Democrats, uh, even libertarians, uh, also or conservatives or liberals. So it's an issue about institutional reform, and I'm not going to... Uh, give away what the uh, actual uh, solution is, and we'll get, uh, let Carl build you up to that uh, solution as he wants, uh, as he wants, uh, works his way through the show. Uh, it's interesting to, uh, to think about this uh, option, and uh, hopefully uh, you can look into the uh, thing in more detail uh, on your own, but uh, it uh, seems to me that it's very similar to something in uh, the U.S. Senate that's going on now, uh, where they're talking about uh, removing the uh, limits on the uh, filibuster, and uh, it's referred to in the media sometimes as the nuclear option. Well, uh, Carl is a former nuclear propulsion engineer on a U.S. aircraft carrier, and in my, uh, in my belief, this book uh, could well be the nuclear option for the American political system to turn it uh, upside down. So welcome to the show, Carl. Well, thank you for having me again, David. Okay, we always enjoy uh, the conversation uh, that we have with Carl. And uh, his approach uh, really uh, is something you can do yourself to change the uh, American political landscape without uh, running for office or joining a uh, political protest movement. So uh, let's start with uh, Carl. Why, why did you write this book to begin with? Well, the uh, genesis of the book really goes back to uh, around 2005, and I was reading a bunch of uh, books about how our political process works really as a hobby. And then during the holiday season that year, I happened to have this conversation with a relative of mine who was going to be graduating from a very prestigious university with a degree in political science. And I was just curious what she had learned during her four years at this institution. So I was asking her questions and, and what really sort of startled me about the conversation was that she had just such a lack of appreciation for our political system. And not just the Constitution, but really the whole thing. And that conversation really bothered me. In fact, uh, the next morning I woke up and I, and I had the idea for the book that I was gonna write this history of American political institutions that would kind of set the record straight on how great they are and, and all the thought that went into them and all the wonderful effects that they've had. And so that was really the, the motivation behind it. And it, it was really to sort of rectify this loss of confidence that I was seeing. And of course, if you fast forward eight years later, um, you know, 53% of Americans don't believe that either political party represents their interests. 37% uh, of American voters fear the federal government. That's according to Rasmussen polling data. 29%, uh, I should say only 29%, believe that their representative in Congress should be reelected, and yet these folks continue to get reelected over and over again. So the, the sort of obvious question is, why is this happening, number one? And what can ordinary folks out there in the country uh, that are sort of outside these centers of power, what can we do about these trends that seem to be really ruining our country? Yeah, a lot of times it's uh, 
your congressman shouldn't be reelected, but uh, mine is doing a good job. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, right. He should be reelected. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, so why do you say the uh, dysfunction of our political system is destroying the country? Well, you can look at so many uh, specific things, even in the last year. I mean, these things certainly go back further than uh, the last eight years. They go back further than the last 10 years. But if you look at all the scandals that are that are cropping up, you know, you had the NSA scandal come to light about a year ago, IRS scandal, the AP, the seizure of uh, Associated Press journalist records. And now it's just an, it seems like every month we're seeing a new scandal, which is just a massive abuse of power. And on top of that is really this, this loss of faith that we're seeing. And it's not just people feel this way. I mean, it's showing up in the polling data. It's showing up in people's voting habits. And people are just, uh, in fact, in, in 2013, there was a record number of Americans who renounced their citizenship. So this is getting to be a real crisis by some measures. And um, so it's really a question of how much longer we can continue before, uh, before our political system reaches this point where people just don't support it anymore. I mean, we really are sort of drifting into that territory. Mm, okay, well, certainly loss of public confidence in the political system is a killer in any country. That is, we've seen what obviously happened in other in other countries around Absolutely. the world. Uh, let me take you back to your book for a minute question I probably haven't asked you before, but um, your book opens with uh, three quotes, I believe, from the Old Testament. And then uh, early on in the first chapter, you talk about something should be prayerfully considered by the electorate or the politicians. Um, so I'm wondering what, um, and I guess that's the only, um, the only relation to a religion that I have uh, saw in your book in the next, whatever, 200 pages, I was just wondering why uh, you chose to open the book that way. I think most of our uh, viewers know that the founders uh, and the Constitution writers were all basically deists, so they probably didn't prayerfully do too much of anything, <laughs> although they were uh, observant of a, of a natural power that was exist there. But you chose three quotes from the Old Testament to start your book. And you want to share why, why you did that? Well, I, I guess uh, the book is, uh, the book was really sort of a leap of faith for me to undertake the project to begin with. Um, actually, one of the quotes is from the New Testament, and oh, okay. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm just going to go ahead and find it here real quick. It's, uh, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. There's actually a really interesting story about that quote and in, in, in how it relates to the book, um, which I haven't told very many people, if any. But as during the months when I was sort of working through whether I wanted to undertake this project full time, I happened to be at the YMCA. And I saw that quote on, you know, it was on one of those whiteboards with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the whiteboard marker. And I remember kind of looking at it and thinking, and this was when I was already thinking about writing the book and sort of sacrificing a career in the financial sector to pursue something that was pretty, it was a pretty speculative undertaking, a real leap of faith. And, uh, and that, that quote kind of stuck with me. It kind of... In, in a real subtle way, it kind of helped me to move in that direction. And it, uh, it stuck with me a number of years after that, even as I was working on the book to say, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'm doing this for a larger reason. And uh, so that's the reason why I chose that book, uh, th that, that particular quote. The other two are more about, in, in the Old Testament, you have this theology of a covenant. And some people compare the Constitution to a covenant. And this idea, the idea in the Old Testament is that when you violate the covenant, you have uh, all sorts of problems that start to happen to, to a nation or to a people. And that was really sort of the uh, perspective that I was taking even, even from the beginning. It's, it's like we have this great Constitution, we don't follow it. What are the consequences if we don't follow it? I think we're seeing those consequences today. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, you know, you and, of course, all of us uh, are under the common belief that uh, we live in a democracy. 
And to some extent, your book says that uh, people's votes don't really matter. Uh, isn't that the heart of what a democracy means, is that people's votes do matter? There's a lot of uh, theory around the word democracy, and, and people have a lot of beliefs about what that means. But if you look at, uh, if you just take a concept like self-government and contrast it with democracy, and you say, okay, democracy is majority rule, it's electing leaders, it's, it's voters going to a polling place and selecting their leaders. And if you contrast that with self-government, which is more of this uh, free circulation of, of citizens in and out of public life, private life. Rotation in office. Rotation in office, precisely. And, that, and that's really what the vision of, of the framers of our Constitution and the founders of this country was. And it's that vision of self-government as opposed to democracy that we've gotten away from. So people can vote all they want today. Um, they're, they're, whether their vote matters is, is a separate question. When you get into issues like money and elections, gerrymandering, um, even if you look at the Supreme Court, I mean, some of these Supreme Court rulings essentially override uh, laws that local self-governments have passed, state governments have passed. And when you sort of take all of these institutions... Of course, the 14th Amendment overrode some of those too, right? Th there's so many different things, uh, th and that's certainly one of them. Um, you have all these things that are really curbing the meaning of that right to vote. In, in sort of what I'm saying in this book, I don't say it directly, but it's certainly implied that we need to look at all these other th things that are going on, and we can't just say, well, go vote. I mean, it, there's more to the equation than, than simply voting, especially when you account for all these institutions. Yeah, well, certainly even <clears throat> voting, uh, yeah, the, the uh, theory of rational ignorance uh, prod uh, predicts that uh, most people it's not in their rational self-interest to learn enough about a political candidate or how his or her election might benefit them to even cast an, an intelligent vote, much less whether that vote would really make any difference in the final outcome of the race, of which none I know of have ever been decided by one vote, uh, you know, of more than maybe a, a municipality of 100 people or so. But uh, right. it just, uh, I, I, it's no wonder that people would feel disenfranchised and yet by going into that booth and pushing that lever somehow they get a feel like well they're they're uh, uh, participating in a quote self-government process right well I'm not even sure that we call it self-government anymore I think we just call it democracy but to your point um, you know I think less and less do people feel like that they do have an influence over the process certainly if you look at voter participation rates in the general election um, you know, it, it's, it's not on the decline right now per se, but, but it has declined over the last hundred years. If you look at the primary elections, which I'm sure we're going to get into more in a minute, which are arguably more important than the general elections in many cases, um, you know, sometimes only 10% of voters turn out in those elections. And yet, those are really the, the elections that determine who gets elected in, in, a, in a lot of situations. Well, what would you say to um, probably uh, many of uh, the uh, strategists in the Tea Party that would say, yeah, let's get after those primary elections. You know, if they're going to be decided by 10 percent of the electorate, we can be 50 percent of that 10 percent and we can elect the kind of candidates that we want in office. Right. Is that a, a strategy with a dead end to it or... I think in the long term, um, and I've had this conversation with other folks as well, um, I think that the Tea Party has a number of inherent challenges because if, if you sort of look at how it's set up, I mean, it really is a grassroots organization. It's ordinary folks who are out there trying to influence ma mainly primary elections because that they realize very intelligently so that that's where you have the greatest influence. Uh, you vet candidates, you endorse candidates. Uh, in some of the Tea Parties send out mail for candidates. Sure. Eric Cantor uh, is a recent uh, victim of that. Isn't right, he? right, right, right. <laughs> um, but when you, when you look at it on a larger scale, the problem is money. Um, and, and, and people talk about money in elections all the time. But what, what doesn't get discussed as much is the fact that money influences elections most at the primary election stage. In other words, the, the general election, 
A lot of those are decided by gerrymandering today, for example, in House seats. Um, but if you don't have money, you cannot win a primary election. That's why we have such high incumbency re-election rates in Congress and even in the state legislatures, because most challengers don't have the resources to challenge an incumbent. Not only that, but the incumbent has probably been saving up political contributions from his former elections that he can unleash if he ever really wants to uh, have to get serious about something. Absolutely, and not only that, but they're in the, the bully pulpit of office, as they say, which allows them to influence policy and write appropriations bills that can funnel money to special interests. So they're really in a position to raise money, whereas a, a challenger is simply not. And the, the race in Virginia is actually an interesting counterexample to what I'm saying. Um, and it's certainly been brought up, well, you know, this is this is this contradicts what you're saying. People have people have said that to me. But really it doesn't because there's five hundred and thirty four other members of Congress. And this is only one case where that's happened in, in recent memory. Yeah. I mean there's maybe Bad a Cochran handful of just others. Won the other so, right, so, and that, that was that was a money race. That was a money race. That's how he won. So, yeah, I can't remember who went down to help him out in that. Uh, From Houston? I uh, no, I don't remember. Some national politician went down to campaign for him. I don't remember who it was now. I'm not. I'm oh well. Sure. Anyway, yeah, money and influence of other national figures right, pushed right, right. him uh, through that. And I could imagine if you were a Tea Party candidate, what are you going to promise to people? You have a fairly long shot chance of being elected and uh, nobody's going to, you know, want to roll the dice with you against an incumbent who's 90, what, 90 X percent of incumbents are reelected anyway. So, you know, if you put your money behind that person in a primary race, it's likely to pay off in some bill or favor or subsidy or vote that will benefit you in the actual uh, lawmaking process. That's exactly right. And uh, most, most campaign contributors they don't think of their campaign contribution as a donation. They think of it as an investment. And an investment. That, yeah. That's a fact uh, in, in many cases. So. Okay. Well, um, we'll hold people, uh, our viewers, in suspense to uh, see what uh, your solution is. Okay. But uh, <laughs> uh, we have, uh, uh, let's, we could cover the, uh, your outline of the mistakes. Uh, that you think people make when they get involved, when they get involved in the political process. And, uh, and you say that uh, the way they get in, usually get involved in the political process makes the system even worse than it would have been if they hadn't been involved. So why don't you elaborate on that for in, in, us? In, indeed, it does. And I think, um, I think the way that most people are, are drawn into politics today is typically by volunteering for a candidate. And uh, a, lot, a lot of times this happens at the primary stage because candidates have to build up some sort of grassroots organization to, to get the word out about their message and their candidacy. But if you look at uh, how our process works today, the fact that it's so candidate-centered is the whole problem. It gives candidates uh, really an undue role in the process. And then once they get elected, and you can see this in a number of historical examples that I get into in the book. But once they get elected, they're sort of the center of authority in elected office, which kind of gives them uh, too much power in some ways. They're, they're the center of their campaign organization that translates directly over into being the center of authority, for example, in the presidency with the White House staff. And it serves to concentrate power in a way that's really not healthy, it, but, it, but it really starts at that campaign stage, and that's where a lot of people enter in. They're not necessarily coming into it from the political party side. They're coming into it from the candidate side. And so um, I, I don't say this directly in the, in the book, but it's certainly the point is made that this issue of, of, of helping out candidates um, is really making the system worse. You also say that uh term limits and uh, can't, uh, campaign finance limits are not a productive way to try to uh, change the leadership in the, in the country today. Right. So let's talk about uh, the term limits thing, first of all. I think a lot of people look at the fact that 90 percent of congressional incumbents are reelected year in and year out. You know, there's people that have been there for 30 or 40 years. 
and they sort of have this knee-jerk response that we need to have term limits. Um, what's very interesting is if you look at, and, and I get into this more in the, in the United States of Dysfunction, but if you look at states that have passed legislative term limits, basically what that means is, uh, you know, someone gets done serving their three terms or whatever it is, and they kind of look around the kitchen table, maybe it's a son, maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a wife, and they have this other person with the same last name go and run for the same office, and it just ends up getting passed around the family. So you can uh, rely on all the people that supported your father to be in the network of people that are supporting you. Exactly. Because they think, well, of course you're going to get your old man is going to have a lot of influence with you, and that, we know about him. That's that's the thinking, <laughs> I, I suppose. And, and certainly, um, if you look at it in term, just in terms of the presidency, uh, we've seen that already. We've seen, you know. Uh, Bush, Clinton, Bush, you know, we had a hiatus there with, with Obama, but now we hear about, you know, the polling data shows that uh, Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton are heavily favored for 2016. And it's sort of this uh, bizarre thing where it's purely by the name recognition that these folks are getting reelected. And it, it's almost in defiance of the term limits because we've had presidential term limits since 1951. But if you look at the spirit of what that means in the last 20 or 30 years, it's, it's meant virtually nothing. Hmm. What about campaign finance laws? Right. So uh, oftentimes the way this is talked about is in terms of contribution limits, so limiting the amount of money that you would give to a candidate. And what I talk about in the United States of dysfunction is, is the idea that um, – that whole way of, of thinking about it in terms of contribution limits is flawed because the real problem is that the candidates have to raise money directly on their own behalf to fund these primary, uh, primary election campaign organizations. So if, if the candidates didn't have to do that, if, if they didn't have to raise the money, then you would eliminate a lot of these issues with money in politics right off the bat. You'd eliminate a lot of the corruption, a lot of the special interest influence. And that's not, not by any means to suggest that you would eliminate it all. I mean, you're always going to have that in any political process that, that involves human nature. But you're just talking about that in terms of the primary. In terms process. of the primary election, um, that's really where the money has the greatest influence today, particularly with special interests. Not that numbers. it's not outspent in the general election, but in terms of the influence it has, you're saying it's disproportionate to the amount that's spent in the general election. That's right. That's right. Yep. Okay. Well, another uh, another solution that a number of people have come up with is that, uh, well, if we're not living under the Constitution as it was uh, originally put together by the founders, let's have a constitutional convention and change it so that it does work. You know, a lot of people say, well, that's just a document that's 200 almost 250 years old now, and obviously it's out of touch with, quote, human nature now, whatever that means, and that we need, uh, you know, we need to significantly revise it and, uh, and change it so it does work for our current times. Yes, so this whole view that we need to have a constitutional convention or even a constitutional amendment that's some sort of going, some, somehow going to magically fix the situation that we're in, um, there's a number of ways to sort of debunk that myth. Um, one of them is to simply look at the fact that we have a constitution that, that elected officials basically ignore today. So you have to sort of ask, well, why, why is that happening? Um, but the other part of it is, and there's a lot of arguments that are made against constitutional conventions and constitutional amendments. Runaway conventions. Runaway conventions. Like and, and a lot of that, I think, is, 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 is valid as far as it goes. But my favorite argument against uh, any kind of constitutional amendment to fix this problem is, well, let's just look at the 27th Amendment. Okay, the 27th Amendment was passed in 1992. It was actually one of the original provisions of the Bill of Rights. And basically what it said, or says, I should say, is that Congress cannot uh, raise its own pay before an intervening election. That's not the exact wording, but, but the idea is that Congress can't raise its own pay during the term and then benefit from that pay raise before another election. 
And if you look at um, a number of things, number of practices that Congress uses, uh, they, they basically bypass that, that provision of the Constitution. It's been challenged in court. The courts have refused to enforce it. And so here you have a prime example of a provision that was added to the Constitution and that is basically ignored by all constitutional interpreting authorities, including the elected officials. And so you really have to get more to, my, my belief is that you have to get more to the root of the problem if you're going to fix it. And just adding language to the Constitution doesn't get us there. Taking out the general welfare clause wouldn't have uh, changed the world. I, I think that they'll just find something else to justify whatever policies that they want to uh, that they want to enact. Yeah. Well, you say the worst uh, idea that uh, any average citizen could have is to run for office, him or herself. What right. It's, it's not the solution to the problem. Uh, if you look at how the system works and how we've gotten so far away from anything that resembles uh, constitutional principle in this country, as a candidate for office, you get caught up in that whole machine. You get caught up in the fundraising. You get caught up in this candidate-centered primary process. You get caught up in this game of having to make these rabidly emotional appeals to voters and you go from being maybe somebody that could have helped out in other ways to being the exact opposite of what the solution to the problem would look like and so I think we're going to get more into it in, in a minute of, of what that solution would look like but it involves ordinary citizens taking up uh, some of this political influence for themselves through procedural changes and it most certainly does not involve people standing up and running for office. Or joining a protest movement of... Uh... Or joining a protest that, that just, you know, maybe makes some TV headlines but again is basically ignored by the political class. I mean if you want these folks to pay attention there's certain things that, that need to be in place that aren't in place right now. Okay, well we're going to get to those very shortly. So, I mean, I certainly think your book has uh, has done a lot to, uh, and certainly would uh, garner a lot of uh, of uh, approval in terms of identifying the problem because there's obviously lots of people out there who think uh, you know Washington is broken, mm -hmm. and we need to do something to to change it. Although, uh, quite honestly, I've never seen the particular solution that you're advocating being uh, <laughs> advertised very uh, very uh, broadly or even narrowly for that matter. So right. it's kind of a very uh, unique solution. So I would recommend to the, to the viewers, if you're uh, looking through Carl's book and uh, you find yourself agreeing with a lot of the things that uh, he is saying what's, uh, is what's wrong with uh, the current system that uh, you'll follow through and read the rest of his book to see uh, what he suggests you might do about it. And I see we have a caller uh, that's calling in right now. So, uh, Excellent. caller, would you like to uh, take time and uh, ask uh, the, my guest a question tonight? Sure. I have a quick question about rotation in office. Do you have any statistics on uh, how rotation in office has uh, changed from the beginnings of the country to the current day in terms of uh, how long did representatives and senators uh, remain in office in the early days compared to uh, these days? So I, I don't have the uh, exact numbers at the at the top of my head here, but um, if you look at the House of Representatives, for example, the average term of service in the House was about six years around the last turn of the century. Today it's about 12 or 13 years, so it's roughly doubled over the last hundred years. If you go back to the beginning of the country, it was a little bit less than six years maybe four years, three years in some cases. So it's gone, it, it's steadily gone up, but it's really spiked in the last hundred years. And also in the Senate, it's just about doubled. Um, I believe the numbers are, are, are similar, uh, uh, maybe eight years to 16 or, or seven to 14, but it's, it's about doubled for both the House and the Senate. Um, and and I, I do get into some of the reasons why, why in the book that we can, I think we're gonna talk about here more in a minute.
Okay. Thank you, caller. Thank you. Um, so we're getting down to the place, Carl, where you can tell us what the, not the, I won't say the average citizen, because I don't think the average citizen, unfortunately, is concerned enough to want to really go out and do something about the political process or may not even be aware of what bad shape it's in. But mm -hmm. to the extent that there are those people out there that are yearning to do something constructive, uh, maybe you could start to uh, outline how a normal activist can start changing what's uh, happening to us in the, in the country. Yeah, so, so in the last conversation we were having there a moment ago, we sort of ruled it out a bunch of things. This is the yeah. part where I get to say, okay, well, now that we've sort of ruled a bunch of things out, here's the, the better way to... It, it, it really starts... I, I want to emphasize this. This is really more a way of thinking about the problem as much as it is a specific proposal. Um, you know, I'm not married to any of these proposals that are in the book, but I think if you just look at history, if you look at how our system worked 100 years ago, it's sort of just common sense to say that, well, if we went back to how it worked before things started going off the tracks, that that, that would just be a way to, to fix the system. It would be less bad than it is. It right? would be it would be less bad. And, and thank you for saying it that way, because... Um, this is not some kind of utopian vision for the country. This is based on, you know, how, insti how political institutions work, how political checks and balances work, and, and frankly, reckoning with human nature. I mean, sort of in the same way the, the Founding Fathers did when they created the Constitution. They didn't have this idea that people were going to be angels. You know, in fact, Madison yeah, right. said men, men are not angels because if, if they were, then we wouldn't need government. Right. That's the whole idea here. So with, with all of that in mind, and certainly with the idea that I'm not trying to say that this is what we must do, it really starts with recognizing the institutional importance of the political parties. And this is something that's very, very much overlooked today, especially for people who are concerned about the fact that the Constitution is basically getting trashed. It's basically being ignored. And the, it, what's interesting is that the political parties really grew up outside the Constitution. And a lot of people would say there's this myth that's out there that the Founding Fathers said that we shouldn't have political parties, which is basically untrue. And I, ta I talk about this in the United States of Dysfunction. But the fact of the matter is the Constitution never would have been ratified if we didn't have this uh, sort of nascent political party organization, because that, that essentially was a partisan struggle as they were, as they were going through that process. So the book really, uh, The United States of Dysfunction, looks at the political parties in, in a constructive way, and it says, how can we use these, institu these existing institutions, these existing organizations, to start to fix our, our political process? And part of that is it begins with ordinary folks getting engaged in the political parties and sort of working through how these organizations work. And there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, Robert's Rules, uh, party conventions, precinct conventions, Senate district or county conventions. Uh, there's county executive committees that meet quarterly for many of these uh, organizations. And so the call to action begins with people recognizing this role that we, we all ideally would play in self-government and sort of thinking about it less in terms of going and casting a ballot on election day or on primary election day and thinking about it more in terms of how do we grapple with these institutions that, that have been with us for a long time but which frankly are ignored today and, and, and not really People don't really know that, that some of these opportunities exist, for example, that you can be a precinct chair, that you can be a convention delegate, and what all that means in the grand scheme of How are they ignored today? You said these institutions are ignored. Well, the, the positions, I, a lot of folks don't even know um, how you would go about becoming a convention delegate, for example. So I guess whether you say ignored, unknown... Um, oh, I thought that you were maybe referring to the candidates who traditionally ignore the political parties once they get nominated. Well, that, that, that too, and we, we can talk about that as well. So in, in, you bring up an interesting point, which is worth getting a little bit deeper into. 
one of the reasons why why the political parties are not really viewed as influential is because the candidates do ignore them today. I mean, the, the political parties can put any resolution they want into uh, a party platform at the state level, at the national level, even, even at the more local levels. And the reality is the candidates are not bound by those platforms at all. In fact, not only can they get elected and, and do they get elected in defiance of those platform planks, but they also get reelected in defiance of anything that the platform says or, or could say. So this is the real disconnect that we have in this country between government and the people. And it's the real gulf that, that, that's been created between government and the people because there's, now, there's no more, no longer are there these intermediaries that can sort of um, negotiate between the two. You have government officials, you have voters that are sort of out there in the masses as spectators, but you don't have folks who can play this role of working in between. And the real problem with that, which you alluded to earlier in our conversation, is this idea that, uh, I think you called it rational ignorance, where, where voters will choose not to research issues, not to research candidates, because they realize that they're only one person in a sea of millions or hundreds of millions. And so how does it really benefit them to really be educated about the process or about the candidates? And that's really the role that these intermediaries used to play. They used to you know, go out and canvas folks in their local neighborhood and say, hey, here's what's going on. And that part of that grassroots part of how our process used to work no longer exists. And on top of that, it's been taken over by money. Because now the only way a candidate can communicate with the electorate is by sending out direct mail or having a TV ad, these very expensive ways of communicating. OK, well, uh, maybe you could um, walk our viewers through what, uh, what steps they could take if we wanted to turn this situation around. Right, so the, the specific call to action that, that's in the United States of dysfunction is, is really to engage in this process of, of party governance. And it, and it starts really at the local level with, uh, you know, going out, becoming a precinct chairman, if, if, that's, uh, if that option is available to you. Um, certainly look into becoming a convention delegate. That starts at the precinct level. In uh, Harris County, it goes up to the Senate district level, if you're in a rural county, it might be a county convention. And then beyond that, it goes to the, uh, to the state convention. And of course, beyond that, on presidential years, it goes to the national convention level. And even just participating in that process is a huge education. Um, it's a great civic education. It's a great education on how our political institutions actually work, how the political process works. And the really neat thing about it is that it's a deliberative process at every stage. I mean, you're face-to-face -face with folks. Um, if you're in a, in a competitive precinct or a competitive Senate district where folks are trying to become delegates to the next level, you know, you're persuading folks, hey, you know, here's why, here's why you should pick me. Here's how I'm going to represent your interests. And it really is this sort of give-and-take negotiation that was really how our system was originally designed to work and how it did work until until about a hundred years ago when everything started going haywire. But uh, I think you make the point if uh, if I'm a uh, if I've taken this step and gotten to be a precinct chairman and a delegate and as long as we have a uh, direct primary to select the candidates I'm pretty much powerless to do anything about who the candidate is by the time I get to the convention. Now, we may have some rousing deliberations and debates about what the party platform ought to say, uh, but the candidate is free to ignore that anyway, so it really has very little effect. So as long as there's a direct primary, I really waste my time trying to work my way up through the political party hierarchy? You bring up a great, great point. And, uh it's a bit, bit of a loaded question, admittedly, since you've read the book. But, uh, but the power of people engaging in the political process through the parties becomes 
power to transform how that process works. And specifically, what I talk about in the book is getting away from the direct primary that we currently use to select candidates and getting more back to what was called then an indirect primary system where you know the voter would still go and uh, go to the polls on primary election day, but instead of choosing a candidate that spent all kinds of money and made all sorts of emotional demagogic appeals to, to get that voter to vote for them, instead the voter would be voting for a delegate to represent them to choose the candidate. Represent and, the voter. To represent the voter. And so you would have the restoration of that intermediary function that used to exist. And then all of this other process of party governance that filters up at every level of government fr from the local level on upward to the national level would be restored to influence. And in a lot of ways, that would work to begin to restore the influence of, of the grassroots and it would begin to mend this gulf between government and the people and it would begin to restore self-government and if you want to call it government of, by, and for the people even. You know, that was uh, Lincoln's great phrase. He didn't originate that phrase, but he used it in the Gettysburg Address. And that's really what we've gotten away from in this country. It, you know, we, we call it a democracy and that's great. Um, we need to get back to government of, by, and for the people. That's what we were founded. Was Lincoln uh, selected by a direct primary or, or by an indirect primary? Oh, he was chosen by convention, yeah. By convention. It, essentially, the con what people normally refer to as a party convention process, the way the voter would see it as an, is an indirect primary. So that's kind of the terminology that, that I've adopted. But once you make that an indirect primary, then it's the convention that would choose the candidate. Would you go far, for, so far as to say that that uh, convention method of uh, selecting candidates led uh, the Republicans to become uh, the second largest party and the demise of the Whigs? Was that the same as uh, Lincoln's first election or not? Uh, so the first time the Republicans had a, a national convention was in 1856, four years before Lincoln was nominated and then elected. But uh, the the... Let me put it this way, the, the Whigs were having national conventions, but they were very fragmented because the Whigs were choosing delegates and, and locking them up by state, whereas the Republicans came along and said, we're going to let every delegate choose their can't choose, you know, we're going to let them all vote individually. And that... So that somebody that had a minority in a number of states could parlay that into a majority overall Correct. with all the states as opposed to uh, yeah, block voting by the states. That, that, that's exactly right. So it became more of a truly national convention as opposed to a sort of confederated convention of state parties. Is that good? I think you could argue both ways. You know, um, very interesting actually is the fact that the Democratic Party up until the late 1960s kept the block voting, as they called it, the unit rule. And the Democratic Party up until that time was the party of state rights. And the Republican Party tended to be more nationalistic. So it, it, what, what's interesting, though, and, and the point to bear in mind is the fact that these procedural changes, they're not just uh, sort of out there in the air. They have a real effect on how the political process works, how candidates are selected, and the type of policies that are made. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible that such a small change could have such a bit of big effect, but yeah, I think that's probably the biggest, uh, <laughs> the biggest surprise uh, gotcha in the book uh, that you have. That when you finally get down to it, you really got to be scratching your head and saying, "Could Carl really be right about this? I mean, could <laughs> such a small procedural change actually cause this tumultuous, upside-down effect that we're?" looking for in the federal government, and to your credit, I mean, I think you document it uh, quite well. I mean, I was totally <clears throat> surprised by, by that. And, and, you know, one of the things you said, even the uh, national uh, financial system fell prey to, uh, in many ways, to the direct primary right. that uh, the caused uh, the influence to, uh, uh, to spiral upwards. 
Maybe you could elaborate on that just a little bit. Well, I, actually, I, I, I want to elaborate on that, but I also want to touch on, on one other thing that you said, which is this idea that, that, that it all sort of funnels down to this one thing. And the interesting thing about that is that it, it took me a really long time to figure that out. I mean, I, I really, when I wrote this book over the course of uh, seven years of independent research, I looked at everything. I mean, I looked at how all these things have changed, how Congress changed, how the federal judiciary changed. And it was really as I was starting to try to explain some of this to people that I realized that I, I just started to realize how central the direct primary system really was and how, how central the nominating process is. Because if you think about it, um, it's the process that we use to select candidates for nearly every elected office in the country. And so when you, when you think about it from that perspective, it's, it's, it's a question of, well, why wouldn't this have a tremendous impact? Um, but to get to your question about the financial system, um, I, I do note that there, in, in, in the United States of dysfunction, that there, there's a, a real correlation between how the nominating process has worked uh, throughout our history. Basically, we've had three major systems that we've used for nominating presidents. It just so happens that we've also had three major systems that we've used for our banking and financial and, and monetary system. And if you lay those two systems over on each other, and I mean, I, I, I'm not going to speak to the fact whether it's coincidence or whether there's some kind of causal effect there, but these things match up exactly. It's very, it's very fascinating when you start looking at how things match up and when you consider the fact that there may have been this influence, you know, that the nominating process did indeed influence our financial arrangements. Okay, well, once uh, people uh, begin to reframe the political direction of, uh, of the party, uh, what's next? Um, for instance, uh, I think the latest polls show that, golly, there may be uh, independents uh, uh, comprise a larger segment of the voting public than uh, either the people that are willing to claim themselves as Democrats or Republicans. And a lot of these people are independents because they don't want to join either party. So how do you overcome the barrier of telling them, well, you really need, if you want to really change the country, you got to join one of these parties? Well, I th maybe I th even the Libertarian Party, for that matter. I mean, I mean, first of all, I think you have to acknowledge the fact that our, our political process is very polarized today, and a lot of that gets to the, the nominating process that we use. I mean, when you only have a tiny percentage of the electorate that participates in that nominating process, and when you look at the kind of appeals and the kind of money that's involved, um, it, it's almost a natural consequence that you would have the kind of ideological polarization that we have today. But, but it the, discourages people from participating. It, 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 and it does, and, and that's the unfortunate condition that we're in today. Uh, but I guess, I guess the way that I would put it to folks is that if you want your interests to be represented, you have to stand up and take the initiative to do that, and not, and not just in a willy-nilly sort of way. I mean, we talked about all the pitfalls that there are, you know, yeah, right. supporting a candidate, um, going out and joining a protest, um, thinking that we're going to have this constitutional convention, constitu okay. constitutional amendment. It's, right. it's more basic than that. Let me interrupt you for a caller. We've got another oh, caller. Uh, caller, could you uh, phrase your question for our guest, please? Yes, I was just uh, watching the show. And first of all, I like you tell the show at TV, and that's one step in getting all of the people rally to do something in society today is to watch this program. How are you doing, Carl? I just, just was very interested in why the Democrats and Republicans pretend that they are all against each other when it's all put together to work to the benefit of the lobbyists. That's what it seems is going on in society today. Um, I mean, I, I would not, uh, I would not differ with you. Uh, I, I would agree completely, actually. And I think a lot of it is posturing. It's posturing for appealing to, you know, certain segments of, of voters. It's posturing to raise money. And that's really what's made the system so polarized and so dysfunctional that, that we can't 
we can't even have reasonable policies anymore because there is no common ground, there is no middle ground between the parties. And, you know, Washington has basically become an absurdity where nothing that makes any sense can get done because everyone's at each other's throats and there, there's just not any rational policy that, that's left to be made. Um, so I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and I, and I just, just to get back to the solution, I think it starts with ordinary people engaging in the process in an intelligent way and reminding these folks that, you know, we're out here and, 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 we, and we, want them to, uh, we want them to be listening to our concerns. Well, you know, in some ways, Carl, that uh, people are saying, well, why should I vote for a Republican or a Democrat? It really doesn't make any difference because nothing's going to change anyway. And yet you're saying the parties are so polarized that uh, people are alienated from the voter, uh, the voting process. And I would say that some people would say people are so alienated from the voting process because both parties are essentially the same big party that's not going to change anything to begin with. It's basically what you're saying is true. Um, you know, the, the numbers kind of break out where a third of people call themselves Democrats, a third call themselves Republicans, and a third in the middle are, are independents. And, it, and that roughly corresponds to, you know, the 25 percent that might vote in a Democratic primary, the 25 that would vote in a Republican, and, and the half of the population doesn't participate in that process. And frankly, the policies don't represent that portion of, of the electorate. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation that we have. And, you know, you get into all the other issues of money and how that influences things. Um, that, that's really where the breakdown is, is occurring. It really is. Thank you, caller. Thank you for uh, taking the time. Let me talk with you. Sure. Thank you for calling in. Um, another point you make in the book, uh, Carl, is that uh, somehow the by choosing candidates through the convention process and people voting for delegates that aren't really tied to any particular candidate but maybe to a set of ideas or maybe just somebody they know and think is a good person and will mm -hmm. represent them uh, honestly if they go to a convention to choose the best candidate and maybe uh, there'll be a lot of backroom deals going on and uh, for people trying to get their delegates together and say, you know, this is our best chance of winning mm -hmm. if we vote for so-and-so. Not that necessarily we all agree with his policies, but in terms of the party, you know, that's what's good for the party is that yeah. We, yeah. we win. And uh, therefore, we need to uh, marshal uh, support behind uh, this candidate. And then that, of course, brings up the specter of smoke-filled rooms right. dis <laughs> deciding the candidates, which is basically probably a very popular uh, railing uh, kind of a of an image that the progressives really use to change uh, our convention, our system to a direct primary. They, they really hammered that into everyone's imagination and, uh, and hoodwinked the public into thinking that this process is somehow nefarious or somehow corrupt. And there are a lot of difficulties with the process. I would never call the party convention process a perfect system by any means. Um, it was really sort of the, the lesser of evils among all the systems that we've had. But certainly if you look at where we are today and just the insanity of our political process, and if you look at all the possible options of what can be done, this is just sort of picking a system that would, be, that would leave us better off than we are. It's by no means uh, a perfect solution. And in many ways, that's parallel to the kind of candidates that we would get. Um, we wouldn't necessarily have candidates out there trying to enact these kind of grandiose policies, um, we would have candidates who, you know, maybe some historians might start to call them mediocre again, like they called all the- Calvin Coolidge candidates. You know, Calvin Coolidge. Uh, who, who even remembers who James Garfield was? <laughs> I mean- He was shot, that's well, the well, biggest- that, uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> the biggest thing. Interesting point. thing about James Garfield, though, he was actually an expert on, the, uh, on how the whole U.S. Treasury government finance system worked. We haven't had a president like that since. Okay. Well, just a, uh, one other last point. You say that uh, you think that this convention process would be result in candidates being, like I think you just uh, kind of referred to, less extreme uh, than 
they are today. They wouldn't be demagoguing certain issues to try to polarize the electorate. And yet you see the, today the convention process by which people can uh, get involved and have something happen to the party, come up with platforms that are more extreme than even the candidates are. And article in the Connick the other day says the Democrats are going to campaign on the Republican platform that, you know, you don't want somebody uh, elected that actually believes in this platform. Right. So uh, look what happens when we have these delegates. They get extreme. <laughs> so, I, and, and, and thank you for raising that point because it does pose sort of an important counterpoint to what I'm saying. But what I believe, and, and this is admittedly hypothetical, but what I believe is that if you had a process where those conventions actually had influence over candidates and, and over the selection of candidates, that you would see more people participating in that and you would start to see a more balanced uh, point of view coming out of the conventions of both parties and that that would have a moderating influence on the political process. And yeah, that could be that uh, if people that uh, select the delegates from their own precinct are not after one issue delegates. Right. If it's more of a grassroots type of coming up from the bottom uh, type of arrangement, I think that you would see some of those issues start to uh, start to fall away. There. Okay, one thing I'd like to follow up with it. You know, your the subtitle of your book is, uh, of course, the United States of Dysfunction: Americans' Leadership Crisis and What You Can Do About It. Why didn't you subtitle your book "Why the Direct Primary System Is Destroying America"? You know, that that's a great question. Um, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question. Why? Why don't I talk about the nominating process at all in the first hundred pages of the book, for that matter? And I think the reason is because it's such an arcane issue where if I started, you know, if, if I, you know, walked up to you on the street and I said, hey, our political system's a mess, you'd start nodding your head maybe and you'd say, yeah, I agree with that. If I started talking about the direct primary system or the nominating process, the first thing that would happen is that your eyes would glaze over. Okay. Well, hopefully, uh, in the show tonight, our viewers' uh, eyes haven't glazed over. <laughs> uh, viewers, we, uh, we uh, appreciate you staying around for the actual uh, punchline that Carl has. Thank you for, for the each callers. And every, Thank each you and every one of you. And uh, it's really a fascinating book that I would certainly recommend to everyone and that it is, uh, represents, uh, you know, maybe as Carl says, not a utopian way to change the system, but certainly a way uh, that uh, we should try and certainly a way that is possible to try uh, without uh, moving mountains and changing the entire national structure by working up through the local uh, uh, party uh, hierarchy to actually elect the kind of, uh, propose for election the kind of people we think can really make a difference. In our, in our country. So thank you, Carl Jarvis, for writing the book uh, to begin with, and thank you for uh, coming and uh, telling us about it on uh, Public Affairs, Public Access tonight. Thank Hopefully we'll me. have you back again in the future sometime. Thank you for having me on, David. It's always okay. a pleasure. Okay.